Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Today, my guest is Tatiana Sawyer. Tatiana is an accountant who knows all too well the financial challenges businesses face. Today, she helps entrepreneurs gain clarity and be confident in their businesses by hosting her popular podcast show, Talk to Tatiana, and with the release of her first book, Dream Bold, Start Smart, Be Your Own Boss, and Make Money Doing What You Love. Tatiana, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So give us some background on you and your life story. How did you end up as an accountant and how did you end up saying, you know what I really need to do? I need to write a book. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's quite a story. So I'll start by saying that I actually did not want to be an accountant initially. Uh, (laughs) When I was 14, my dad's friend came over from another country and um, I asked what he was doing and he said he was a, a lawyer. So not an attorney in court, but actually a person who is developing documents and drafting contracts. And I was completely mesmerized by this idea of being a a lawyer. And that's kind of what I've been wanting to be since I was about 14. Um, I even started law school. So in um, Russia, law school is a five-year kind of grad undergrad degree. So you have to, at 17, you have to decide whom you want to be and go to that um, department. Um, it's not like, um, you know, uh, here where you get to take a few courses and think what you, see what you like. There, you actually select a career when you're 17. And naturally, people often don't even work in the field that they choose. But, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer so bad that I, <laughs> that I went um, two years I spent in law school out of five. And I loved it. I loved the law. I loved um, getting to know it. And I've been watching Law and Order since I was, I don't know, 13 or 12. And I loved it. Mr. McCoy is my jam. But then I came to the United States. And in the United States, um, in order to become a lawyer, I needed to get my bachelor's first. So uh, as I went to, to college to get my bachelor's, I needed to pick a major. And I was thinking, you know, at the same time, I was working as a bookkeeper for a small business, very small business. And and I thought, you know, I need a skill. I need something that can carry me through financially because I was here by myself financially through college and then through law school so that I can support myself, you know, buy food, pay rent and that kind of stuff. And I decided to do accounting because, you know, I was I thought, you know, this is something that you can always find a job for. And I picked accounting and I was at Hunter College and Hunter College um, accounting department is very, is doing some smart stuff. And what they did was they were brainwashing us and saying, well, if you're majoring in accounting, you might as well sit for the CPA exam. And I thought, "Hmm, maybe, you know, maybe I should do that because like I'm already doing it. Why not? (laughs) And kind of somewhere in the process, because I was also learning theory uh, during the day and applying it. Uh, actually, it's backwards. I was learning theory in the evening and then applying it at work during the day. Um, to me, was direct effect. You know, theory and practice uh, kind of got married every day, and it was really fascinating. So, I fell in love with accounting, and I kind of abandoned the idea of going to law school altogether. But um, I fell in love with accounting. I got a chance to work for with small businesses since then with a ton of small businesses and each and every business is different, different industry, different people, different leadership styles. And I learned a lot from all those folks and um, certainly learned to to be a better accountant. And then at some point uh, I was listening to this guy. I don't even know how I got across, came across this person. And he said, well, if you want to be an authority um, in your industry, you need to write a book. Um, and that idea kind of was, um, sitting in my, in my head for a few years, quite a few years, um, until I came across, I got coached, um, in profit first, I got coached in efficiencies. I got coached in technical tax planning where we look at a tax return and we see an opportunity to save someone money on tax. And all of that 
prompted me to want to write a book even more. And um, I and profit first. Are we talking about Mike Michalowicz, his book Profit uh, First? Correct. Yes, okay. Profit First. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a you know very well known cash management system, and I've been applying it before I even read the book and before I joined the Profit First professionals for clients. And it's really been a, an interesting journey. So when I joined Profit First professionals, I realized that I wanted to write a book that would be a business card book, and I wanted to grow my business, my accounting firm. I wanted to grow it, but grow it smart, um, not volume, but actually quality. So more involved clients, work with them more often, work with them on a deeper level, teach them, train them, coach them to be better in business, be better with numbers, be better with cash. And um, then I reached out to Mike and I wanted to write potentially a derivative book of Profit First because I had a little tiny specialty in one industry. And Mike was like, you know, you should come to this event for authors that we're throwing. And <laughs> And as I was sitting at that event and he was talking about all the marketing ideas he's ever implemented and, and stuff, I found myself thinking that, you know, I love doing taxes. I love the geeky tax stuff and the accounting and business, but I don't to just do that for the rest of my life. Um, and he kind of gave me a glimpse of what an author's career could be like. And I got hooked. I no longer wanted to write a business card book. I wanted to write a book that actually changes lives. So I joined a workshop um, that taught me to um, actually be able to do that, to write a book, to develop content, to test drive content, um, to structure content, to tell a story. Um, and uh, I wrote this book that just launched in March. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are. And by the way, I got to say, your book cover is one of my favorite book covers. I love everything about it. So we're going to have to dig into that later. But before we get there, this book. So tell us a little bit more about the content of the book and how you came up with the idea. What was the genesis of this is the book I'm going to write for my first book? So when I joined the book workshop, the top three book workshop, the owner of this workshop is actually Mike Michalowicz's writing partner. Um, she taught us to think about who the book is for as opposed to what the book is about. And I wanted to understand where my ideal reader is on their journey and what they're struggling with. And this book, I want to say that it was easy to write. It wasn't easy to write and publish, but it was a lot easier because I've already had 15, 16 years of client stories, case studies. I already had all that content. I just, I just needed to create a system. And I wanted to create a system, a roadmap for someone who has a business idea or wants to work for themselves, wants to be their own boss, not sure where, where to start, to, be, to have a grip on money, numbers, and taxes. So I wrote the book in plain English because we accountants have a tendency of speaking to people um, using words and terms that people don't understand. And because they don't want to seem um, like they don't know anything, they don't want to feel um, less than worthy, they nod um, and pretend that they understand and they don't often. And that's what I wanted to avoid. So I wrote the book specifically uh, to, to tell them in plain English that it's possible. The problem that I saw was that a lot of folks started businesses and kind of dove right in and had a vision, and that vision was carrying them through this, this journey. Um, but they never paid attention, many of them never paid attention to numbers, taxes. It was kind of set aside, put on a back burner, and sometimes never addressed, sometimes kind of managed um, kind of sporadically throughout the, their, their journey throughout the year or a month or a week. And I found that actually my clients who've taken on this responsibility to understand, they're not accountants, they don't understand everything I do, but to understand how to approach taxes, how to deal with government agencies, how to manage cash, that's a big one and how to set up a business so that it's actually making money and gives you the lifestyle, not only the financial lifestyle, but also the time lifestyle that you want 
is a skill and it needs to be, um, in order to get there, you have to actually face your numbers. And those who have done it well, my clients um, have done exactly that. And that's what I wanted to, to show possible for someone who's just sitting there and thinking, you know, I really like photography. How can I make a business out of this? This is such a great niche because as an entrepreneur myself, and most of our listeners on this podcast are entrepreneurs as well, I think we all understand that taxes and finances is not our first love as entrepreneurs. And yet we know, yeah, we got to do that stuff. We got to take care of that stuff, but we don't really want to. And we'd prefer that somebody else do it, but we have to do some of it ourselves. We have to at least have a basic understanding. Uh, for the record, I failed accounting 101 three times, basically in college. Uh, I, my final grade was a C plus and I was like, great, I'm done with this class. And uh, that's kind of haunted me through my entire business career too. It's just P and L's and balance sheets. It's never been my strong suit. I'm always just like, go to my bookkeeper and I'm like, do I have money in the bank account that I can spend? Yes. No. Okay, great. And that's all I need to know. And so I'm relieved to hear that you've written a book that even I can understand about uh, how to run a business from a financial standpoint. So with the book, what was your writing process? As you started to write this book, how did you get it out of your head and out of your experience and onto paper? Well, the first draft um, <laughs> was like having a baby. And it, I want to say that it was the longest labor that I've ever had. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, just like with everything else, um, it's interesting. I was fortunate because I joined this workshop. And in the workshop, um, AJ Harper gave us basically a matrix on how to develop structure, how to develop your chapters, and how to fill the teaching points and the um, learning points within your chapters with stories. So the, I, I guess the toughest part of the process was coming up with the structure, making sure that the flow is there. Where do they start? What should come next? What should follow that? And why it's coming in that order and why it's important. Um, and certainly stories is something that there are plenty, there's plenty of um, throughout the book. They're all real stories, client stories. Some names have been changed, but they're all stories of real people, just like the reader. And I wanted to relate to each and every reader that picks up the book. And I wanted them to find themselves in one of the people um, that I've worked with, uh, basically. So I wanted, I came up with the teaching points and the, um, I guess the, the main, um, main point of each chapter. And then I looked at the structure. Um, and then for each of the teaching points, I, um, came up with a story. So I already had a bunch of stories, just wrote them out and organized them. And that was the first step. Then the writing was easier because I already have the expertise, um, and I already have the story. So just making sure that the story highlights the point that I want to make that was really um, challenging. I wrote my first draft in about four months, basically attending writing sprints at 6, 6 a.m. on um, every weekday. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I was waking up at 5.55 and joining those sprints and what I was writing, but it worked. Now, is this uh, part writing, of the workshop, these sprints? Like, was it a group thing? Yeah, it was, it was. So it was actually really good because it really motivated you to show up, not just for yourself, but also for other people and, and write and just whatever, um, whatever comes to your mind. Sometimes I wrote a thousand words, um, in an hour, sometimes I wrote 200. So not setting expectations high, but just setting an expectations, ex expectation of writing consistently. That was really, you know, combined with the structure of the outline, um, and stories that filled that outline. Uh, were the two things that really made a difference um, in writing this book. How were those sprints set up? Like, was that a Zoom meeting with everybody on and everybody's just sitting there working and writing on their book? Or did you check in on Slack or email or something? Like, how is that structured? It's actually very interesting. And I do something similar for um, people who want to do their own bookkeeping. <laughs> so we would join on Zoom at 6 a.m. There are other times too, but for me, it was 6 a.m. and I'm done for the day. 
<laughs> which was awesome. Um, so 6 a.m., we would start writing. Someone would do a timer of 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, then when the time would um, come, uh, the person who was um, timing everyone, she, she or he would also be writing. Um, they would say, you know, time, let's break. Um, we would break for five or 10 minutes, talk about other things or ask questions um, or share um, our content and ask for feedback or, or all of the above. And then we, will do the, we would do the same for another 20 to 25 minutes. And that's basically your hour. So by the end of the hour, like I said, I could write 250 words because let's say I just didn't feel inspired that day. Or I could write 1,200 words because it was just pouring out of me. Or you could be doing research. You could be doing other things to work on the book, right? You just had Correct. to be doing something on the book. Correct. And this yep. was five days a week, Monday through Friday? Yep. Wow, that is interesting. I haven't heard of a program like that before, but that's a great idea. And obviously it worked. It got the book done, right? Yeah. <laughs> Were there any, was there any point during the book writing process where you got stuck? You felt like, oh, I don't know how to get past this, or I just don't want to work on it. Did you run into any of that? Absolutely. I mean, I don't remember all of the times that I've run into that, but <laughs> but certainly chapter seven um, of the book that has the entity selection matrix, I wanted to create something um, that's proprietary. I wanted to create something based on my not only text preparation experience, but also text planning experience, something that will allow, would allow people to form the right type of entity from the start and understand what they're forming. Because what I found was that entity, especially in the United States, um, is a big deal. It has direct effect on the amount of tax that you're going to pay. So whenever I do tax planning engagements for clients, the first thing I look at whether their entities are structured correctly with the most efficient tax setup. But when a person is just starting out, sometimes they don't have the luxury of forming you know, several entities for tax efficiencies. And then often with the traditional accounting model of having you know, hundreds of clients and not really spending enough time on each client during tax season to actually help them save money, that kind of created this um, generation of entrepreneurs who Googled or whatever, um, a, an LLC, um, a company formation, it's not a corporation, but it's a formation, of a kind, and then they just never do anything with that LLC, meaning even when they're making money, um, earning a good profit, they still keep the LLC and keep overpaying tax for years, sometimes for decades. So I wanted to create something like that. And I really was procrastinating that I didn't want to continue writing other parts of the book until I figured that one out. So, you know, after I came up to chapter seven, which was actually previous to chapter six, um, I thought, you know, like I can't move forward. So I was stuck for a couple of days, um, maybe even a week or a week and a half working on that matrix. So to make it easy, of course, there are multiple entities. Of course, there are other options for people. But for a simple start business, that matrix was my um, stumbling block. Like I just, I got um, really behind. I mean, a week in a writer's um, journey is a lot. <laughs> So I really, I really got um, held back um, because of that. That is interesting. And so how'd you finally break through that? I just kept working on it. Just kept looking at the matrix because there were some duplications. There were some arrows that weren't working. There were some things that I didn't like. Um, and um, after about a week and a half, um, maybe even two weeks. So I started, like I came up with a draft um, and then when I started writing again about the matrix to kind of take someone on that journey, I realized that it doesn't work. And then I went back to the drawing board. So that was quite a, quite a journey uh, on, this, on this book journey. That's interesting. Do you, do you think that there was part of your brain that knew something wasn't quite right? And that's what was making it hard to move past that is you knew there was something in the, need, that needed to be fixed somehow? Well, um, you know, as an accountant, I know, and especially as a tax planner, I know exactly um, which entities work and which don't. And uh, I wanted to create a choice for someone who's forming one business, one entity. I wanted to create that matrix. And 
I wanted to, all the prior chapters, so chapters one through six, I wanted those elements. So there's an element about partnerships. Should you partner with someone? There's an element about investors. Should you look for investors? I wanted those elements to be a part of that matrix. And um, because of that, every time you look at something, even if you've looked at that thing for you know 20 times, you still realize that, you know, but what if that scenario happens? As an accountant, I know the pros and cons of each entity. Um, certainly, you know, um, <laughs> like the back of my hand, but um, that's kind of what was prompting me to, um, to go back to it. I felt like, you know, I've missed something. And for an accountant to miss something is uh, the worst nightmare ever because we never want to miss anything. We always want to consider all things involved. And that's kind of what the thought process was. Something wasn't working. I knew that logically, okay, maybe there's another scenario where this matrix doesn't apply. So I went back and worked on it and worked on it and basically developed it to where it is today. Perfect. So then you had your manuscript and how did you decide to publish your book? Um, so part of, the, part of the workshop was also talking about the different publishing paths. And um, I just realized that self-publishing was just not for me because even though I can certainly take that on and um, manage it well, everything I do, I do 100%. If I, you know, if I take it on, I do it 100%. So I realized that in order for me to get a really great editor, developmental editor, for example, someone who looks at the structure, at the flow of information, how uh, teaching points relate to each other and to um, the reader, um, it would probably be you know anywhere from thirty to fifty thousand dollars just for that one person. And I wanted that person to be really good because realistically, editors are what take your books to, book to the next level. And I realized that I just can't afford you know a fifty thousand dollar editor that I want. So I figured you know I don't want the stress of the traditional publishing path because um, in order to get that deal, you have to sell your soul to the devil. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you, have to, you have to realistically sell your rights to the book just for the advance. Um, plus, you know, when you publish an audiobook, you don't keep your rights and things like that really prompted me to go for a hybrid publisher where I get to keep my rights, I still get trade distribution, I still get my book into libraries and all those things. And plus they really project manage this thing. And honestly, it was the best choice I've ever made because um, that project management of this book process was just crazy, like nightmare crazy. <laughs> and so who was the hybrid publisher that you decided to work with? Um, page two, that's a Canadian publisher. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you had a positive experience with them if it was the best decision you've ever made in your life. Absolutely. It's, it was the right decision. It's, um, the company, the company's values are very aligned with mine. Um, because this book was not a, a business card book. You know, if I was just publishing a book to just for the sake of publishing a book, I maybe would have done it self-published and, you know, just got the book out and that's it. But I wanted um, a meaningful distribution. I wanted my message to come across and I wanted people to learn more about it. I wanted it to get into libraries, into universities where there's um, entrepreneurship programs because nobody's teaching folks real entrepreneurship, especially like high schools or um, early college years. My, my college that I went to has an entrepreneurship certificate, but you have to understand that you wanna start a business in order to go for that program. But most people just go for the pro, just go for um, starting a business and don't take any courses. So I wanted to create a roadmap for those folks. And that's why um, a hybrid publisher allowed me to, to, to still get the distribution, but also have the top designers, editors, um, team behind me to support me in that. Mm -hmm. Quick break here. Are you an entrepreneur? Do you want to write a book that will help you grow your business? Visit PublishedAuthor.com, where we have programs to fit every budget, programs that will help you write and publish your book in as little as 90 days, starting at just $39 per month. 
Or if you're too busy to write your book, we'll interview you and then write and publish your book for you. Don't let the valuable knowledge and experience you have go to waste. Head on over to PublishedAuthor.com to get the help you need to become a published author. You've already waited long enough. Do it today. Now, back to the show. So what were some of the highlights of working with page two where you said, oh, I'm so glad I'm working with this pub- this hybrid publisher instead of doing this on my own? There were, there were a number of things uh, that really were life-changing. There was a project manager assigned to my book. Um, she kept track of the process, when the editor needs to be involved, when I, get, when I, when I need to turn in my edited manuscript, There were a couple of rounds of developmental edits, copy edits, um, uh, proofreaders and and things like that. Um, Also, same thing with cover design. So someone or someone kept track of all of those things and not me. (laughs) So someone was looking at the timeline and saying, "Okay, so we're sending her the edited manuscript. If she can get it back to us in a week we can be on schedule to publish on time. We can be on schedule to give this other person, this designer to work on a book cover and things like that. So that was really the highlight for me that someone kept track of all the deadlines, all of the um, relationships, all of the people involved in the process, because I don't know how I would have managed that, especially with the year that we just had. Uh, I don't know how I would have managed this whole process plus run a business plus uh, launch another business at the same time and have a family. So, you know, the, to answer your question, the highlight was really the project management aspect, plus top designers and top um, editors um, that the company has and distribution channels and printers. Yeah, it's, I often think that writing a book is kind of like starting a business. I mean, you have to learn everything from scratch. And I mean, self-publishing a book, self-publishing a book is like starting a business. There's so much to learn. There's so many different factors that go into it. And that's why people go to traditional publishers. But a lot of people still don't know that there's this hybrid in the middle where you still get to own your book, but then they take care of a lot of the things that you need them to take care of. So now I really want to talk about your book cover because page two (laughs) does great cover design. But you're the first person I've actually interviewed on the show who's worked with page two as an author. Tell us a little bit about the cover design process and how page two worked with you on that. So I, uh, at some point in 2020, I hired a marketing director, someone who manages not only Facebook ads, but also branding and kind of all the messaging that's aligned, like he doesn't do the message writing for me, but he says where the messages are not aligned, where the brand colors aren't aligned and things like that. And what he told me was that my colors are all over the place. (laughs) And he came up with a color palette that really um, had both bright colors and also um, dark blue colors, which, um, which are one of my favorites. So something that was really balanced and really Um, pretty, um, but not overly extravagant. And he developed this color palette for me. So when I, uh, when the time came to work on the cover, I sent the publisher the color palette and I said, I would love to stick to these colors throughout the process because that will look really well on my website. And um, just my kind of I guess with colors across the board um, are very much aligned and and, and look really well together. And they've, the biggest problem with choosing a cover is because is the, the fact that they send you a ton of options and you like all of them. (laughs) And what's interesting is my, my cover journey was actually interesting in the sense that I've actually settled on another cover before this. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Before this one, yeah, I had like also a two part, um, like a two color book. The reason I wanted two colors is because my book is split into two parts dream bold part and the start smart part. And I wanted to visually create that as well. Plus, Mike Michalowicz was kind of in, in my brain telling me that he looks at the book spine. And I don't know if you have, you've seen my book spine, but it's actually really cool too. It's actually like that. So it's something that stands out on a bookshelf at a bookstore. And um, 
he, uh, you know, he said that it's he he picks picks up books and ideas for his next books um, by the spine often because that's what you see when you go to to a store. So I picked this this cover, which was dark blue top and kind of um, like nude, um, closer to white color bottom. And I really liked it, but, but the publisher went to a, I don't know, some conference of publishers where the feedback was that for a book like that, the cover is just not bold enough, <laughs> which was really interesting. And we said, okay, we went back to the drawing board. We went back to the palette um, of my brand colors and um, the publisher were, really wanted to have the, you know, those prime prime colors the magenta and the cyan um colors uh, for the book and i just didn't like it i just thought it was too binary you know like those colors are typically the ones that are um representing male and female and i just didn't want that association with my book <laughs> so we kind of came up with this um and um, I think that that's a perfect color. It looks really beautiful. If you go to my website, you will see that the colors align so well with the book cover. My brand colors align just uh, perfectly well. And another thing that I wanted to say about a cover is that I knew early on that I wanted a hardcover book. And um, the publisher at some point were insisting on potentially doing a soft cover. Um, and I just said, I just said, no, I just, you know, it's yes, it costs almost double to print um, a hardcover book, but I just like the feel of a hardcover book. And, I, and I'm so happy that I did that because now holding my book in my hand just actually makes me proud of myself. <laughs> it does feel better. I mean, it's just got that heft to it and it just, it looks good and you just feel like you've got something more substantial. Yeah. So I'm also curious about the process you went through for the title, because I think it's a great title as well. Dream Bold, Start Smart. What was your process working on the title? Was that you, did the publisher get involved or how did you come up with it? Um, the title, initially I wanted the title to be about unicorns because at the time my daughter <laughs> was involved with unicorns and I just liked the idea. <laughs> It's a creature that's, you know, uh, everyone wants to see. It's magical. I don't know, whatever. But um, when, I, when I worked on developing my reader, who that person is, where they are in their life, in their career, maybe, or anywhere in between, I realized that many of my clients, I work with a lot of creatives, many of my clients have this dream. And often that dream is so bold, but they don't have the foundation to build that dream to do that better. So what usually happens, and actually one of my clients, one of my favorite clients once told me that, you know, visionaries don't start businesses, he said. Um, um, accountants don't start businesses, sorry. Visionaries do. Because accountants, we are very pragmatic and practical. We run the numbers. Oh, the math doesn't work. Fine, forget it. But visionaries, visionaries, <laughs> visionaries don't care about that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And often, you know, I stopped working with startups a couple of years ago because typically they don't have the budget for someone like me. But um, I realized that when prospective clients come to me, when they're already further into their journey um, and they can afford someone like me, I found myself thinking that I only wish they started better. I only wish they knew some of the basics because what happens is people want to start a business. They have this vision and then, oh, do I need to get an accountant? Oh, I don't have the money to pay them right now. What do I do? You know what? I'm just going to start and I'm just going to do it and wing it and whatever. And then also when you have a low budget, you know, you get what you pay for. You get a professional often that you can't even call a professional, but you don't know that because it's really hard for a non-accountant to assess um, an accountant's abilities and ethics and all these other things, you know, when you're looking at a bunch of documents with numbers on it. <laughs> so I just thought, you know, if only they can start smart, if the only they could start better. So the title kind of came, came as a result of kind of looking at other books. Um, 
I wanted it to be a short title, although it came out long. <laughs> I was looking, you know, Mike McCallowitz certainly had a lot of influence on my author career, and he's been very supportive um, of authors in general and of me um, as well. And his book's so always short titled, you know, Fix This Next, Profit First, Surge, um, Pumpkin Plan. They're short and sweet um, and don't necessarily give away what's in it. Um, so I wanted to create something like that. So somewhere, you know, in the workshop, we have a Facebook group and I just posted some variations of potentially action steps. Um, sometimes titles are action steps. Sometimes they're a promise. Sometimes they're all these other things. And I wanted mine to be, um, hope. And that's how this title, uh, was settled on before I even reached out to the publisher. Initially, the title was Dream Bold, Launch Smart. I wanted to kind of um, have the analogy of a rocket launch, but uh, then there were these other books, Rocket Fuel and other things that use the same analogy. So I wanted to be different. <laughs> so start smart. <laughs> Got it. Launch Smart would be, that would be great too, but I think Start Smart's great. You got a little bit of, of alliteration going on there. So it's good. Well, that's great. So now the book just came out. Let's see, when was the publish date? Just came out recently. March 16th. March 16th. And we're recording this May 11th. So it's almost been two months that it's out. How's the reception been? How's the reaction been? The reaction at, with the target audience has been phenomenal. People say that it's the book they wish they had when they started their first business that, let's say, failed or whatever. Some people read the book and their feedback is that it gives them hope that they can actually start a business, especially creatives and moms, which is, which are the two audiences that I wrote this book for are the ones that need that extra support, that extra confidence, that extra clarity, um, in what to do next, how to even begin that it's not that scary. And the feedback from those folks, uh, from ideal readers, was uh, has been phenomenal. You know, since it launched. So, what was your launch plan? What was the marketing that went into this before launch and through launch? <laughs> Again, Mike Michalowicz has been a lot of influence on that. He's I don't know if you know a lot about his marketing techniques, but I was just my my mind was blown when I went to that event for authors. This was in 2019 when I went and he was talking about things like that he was doing, like, you know, having his mom write a request to, you know, for an endorsement and that kind of stuff, like just blew my mind. I was like, oh my God, like I would have never thought of that. And uh, so as I got into the author community, I realized that when you become an author, you become a book promoter. And that's really a journey in and of itself. Yes, you have the book that you work on, but you also have this promotion part. So in 2020, in about July, I decided that po podcasts are a great way to promote books and to get audiences, especially bigger podcasts. And um, so I got a service that booked me on the podcast. That was one of the strategies. I also came up with a number of bonuses, pre-order bonuses to induce pre-orders for people. I gave them um, some content to help them, let's say, analyze their existing business or come up with um, things that they need to address before the book came out if they were starting a business. It was a checklist called Side Hustle to Business, plus I recorded some explanation for that. Um, and examples to help people really start businesses better, to pay attention to different things. I also kind of recruited um, uh, what's called the street team. And the street team were people who had audiences um, and who agreed to support my book, my book launch. So people did different things. Some just posted on Instagram, some um, you know, took pictures with the book. I got everyone a little promo package that was specifically designed for them. The box was custom with my book on, on, the, on, the, on the side and these kinds of things. And I sent them a little gift to thank them for, for helping my book launch. Um, and so basically between being a guest on a podcast, uh, pursuing media mentions, um, recruiting a street team, 
developing bonuses for bulk orders and for just kind of individual pre-orders. Um, all of those things were part of the marketing strategy for my book launch. Awesome. What what worked the best and what didn't work as well as you thought it would work? <laughs> Um, I feel the the podcasts have worked the best. Uh, the influencers, the street team, um, it worked well for some. So I had about 32 people on the street team slash influencers, people with their own audiences. And some folks went above and beyond. Some folks had me live on their Instagram, on their Facebook, to their communities. We talked about things and topics discussed in a book, but something that's super helpful to the listeners. And um, some did nothing. <laughs> so that I think was a little, um, not disappointing, but I, I, I did expect that um, in some way. Mike kind of warned, uh, warned about this kind of thing um, at the events. And, um, but some people really, I was amazed at how much they, um, put into energy, put into promoting my book. And we just, you know, they're not my best friends. We, you know, we're not, we've met maybe a month before that. So I was just really amazed and thankful and grateful for those people who really believed in my message and believed in the fact that I think my book will change the world, <laughs> even if it's just the United States. <laughs> Great. Well, Tatiana, thanks so much for talking with us here today about your book journey and everything that went into it and how it's uh, come out on the other end. For people who want to connect with you, where's the best place for them to find you? Um, thanks so much, Josh, for having me on the show. And um, it really is a pleasure to share my book journey. It's It's been really great. I'm very grateful for the people that I met and everything um, in between. Um, to connect with me, people can go to talktotatiana.com and um, get my free checklist or um, check out my podcast or just read about me and my story um, and my work. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for being with us here today on the Published Author Podcast. Josh, thanks again. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit publishedauthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources. 